Hello, my name is Alex. Uh, I'm coming from Cluj, Romania. Uh, does anyone hear me okay? Is it, I, I hear it very strange. And, okay. Um, I'm, a, I'm an engineering manager at a, at a local company from Cluj called Fortech, uh, where we do um, uh, online services, work on various um, uh, websites, web applications. So I lead a team of approximately 20 JavaScript engineers. Um, and I'm also the co-founder of JS Heroes, which is uh, the biggest JavaScript uh, conference in Romania, and also uh, a, the com a community built around the conference where we do a lot of things. So if you're interested in that, if you want to um, find out more about the conference, um, do let me know. I also have some stickers um, with me, so we can talk more afterwards. Uh, I want to talk about performance today, and I, I really, I really liked that um, the conference had a lot of uh, had a lot of focus on performance so far. We've seen uh, uh, Vitali's talk yesterday on on performance. We also seen uh, Harry Roberts talking about third party performance. Uh, m the focus of this talk is to uh, generally go through uh, some some performance improvements that you can you can do in your applications, things that you can actually do tomorrow to to improve the performance. But most most importantly, if, if there's one thing I want you to take from this is the idea of of getting a performance mindset, of of, of getting the developer to to a, uh, to a point where he's familiar with uh, potential performance problems, so um, so he or she can act before uh, before they actually happen in production. So to bring performance as a sort of like a, as a first class citizen in your in your day to day activity. The same way I don't know coding and testing is, and uh, keeping in mind security, potential security threats, and so on. Um, so, in order to uh, to go through uh, performance, I, I kind of like so there's a lot of a lot of there's a lot of content on performance, but still, I don't feel that there is very a very clean structure or how to approach it. And I, I try to outline uh, three different um, categories of of problems that you should address. Uh, if you if you search uh, some of my other talks online, you will see that uh, Alice is a recurring character in my stories. Um, Alice is a front-end developer, uh, and she is tasked with uh, making sure that the website she's building is is running will be performant enough. Alice works um, at in modern web app, in a modern web application. So we're talking things about things like React, Angular, or Vue on the front end. Uh, and, and all the things that I will go through actually today will not necessarily address your traditional PHP or Ruby on Rails um, or Java JSP application, which is sort of like more server driven. We, we will address performance in the context of modern front end, in, in the context of an application that is built with something, with Webpack, with Babel, with uh, some sort of framework or not, it doesn't really matter, but uh, it's, it's this kind of architecture that, that we want to address. So Alice um, has to improve performance, and she she's sort of like the the um, this game of performance is sort of like played in three different chapters. First of all, is Alice against the browser in the story called A Clash of Resources. Uh, then it's Alice against the application size in the story called A Storm of Kilobytes. And finally, it's Alice against JavaScript and CSS itself in uh, A Feast for Frames. Now we will go uh, over over each of these, and we will see uh, what Alice can do. Uh, for for each story, we will try to find an objective, like a main objective that we want to um, that want to happen, and we will see some steps that need, that can be done to to make sure we we reach that objective. So the clash of resources is the point at which uh, Alice. Um, works to improve the load time of the website, right? the initial rendering phase. And in order to understand that, let's quickly go over how, uh, the, how the loading phase should be, which is the order in which it should happen. So if you have the browser and the server, um, and you fetch, a, fetch an application, um, the first thing you get is an HTML, right? And this here, this, this period here is called time to first byte, or um, 
In other words, this is the performance of the server, how fast the server can deliver an HTML. Now, of course, the browser cannot render just HTML because it would look pretty silly. Um, but as soon as the browser starts parsing HTML, um, it finds external resources, CSS, fonts, maybe JavaScript, uh, anything that can be found in the head, then it moves to the body. When the browser uh, finds a resource, it will stop the parsing and it will fetch that resource. So uh, at some point, we do have the DOM ready event, which, um, which happens when the browser has finished parsing the HTML. And at the same time, the browser receives external files like CSS, like fonts. So as soon as the DOM is ready and the browser has the CSS uh, or other resources that it fetched, uh, it can do the paint CSS. Um, this is where the CSS OM is constructed, like the corresponding of the DOM. And finally, we have the first uh, milestone in, in the rendering phase, which is called the first meaningful paint. This is when the user actually sees uh, more or less what we, what we want our application to look like. Uh, maybe not all the images are loaded. Maybe, um, maybe some content is missing. Maybe there are some spinners around for missing content. But uh, still, the, the, the user will see approximately uh, how the website has to look. He, uh, will see, he or she will see the layout, the, the menu, and stuff like that. In this point, keep in mind that we, never, we didn't uh, tackle yet the JavaScript part. Uh, at this point, as after the first meaningful paint, ideally we want to start fetching our JavaScript. We want to make our Ajax requests, if any, um, to, to, to actually load the, the rest of the application. And as, uh, as the browser starts uh, parsing, executing, and, and compiling JavaScript, we will, we will talk about that a bit later. But this period here uh, is a period where the user, although, uh, although the users see the website, they cannot really interact with it. Like um, inputs cannot be properly focused, the scroll doesn't really work. This is because the CPU is vastly used, is vastly busy with, uh, with parsing and executing JavaScript. As soon as the CPU is uh, kind of like get some free, uh, some free cycles, we have the page interactive event. This is the second important milestone. And finally, we have the full load event when everything is there, images are, are fetched, uh, I know everything, everything is loaded like third parties and so on. So this is what, this is how, how the browser uh, interaction looks like. Now, for the first chapter, remember, we are interested in the loading. We're interested in just to get, uh, to get the meaningful content as soon as possible to the user. So first time, we're going to focus on this part. And this part here is uh, what we call the um, critical rendering path. So this is what we want to optimize. Uh, this, is what, this is why we want to get the, the first meaningful paint as soon as possible uh, to the user. And here's, for example, an, an analysis on an e-commerce website from Romania, a pretty big one. Um, but they didn't, don't really focus on performance, so they have really bad performance, especially on mobile devices. And you can see here that they have 15 resources in their critical chain. This means that the browser has to stop 15 times as it parses the HTML to fetch some external resource. And they even have a lot of JavaScript that they, uh, that they parse. Uh, that, that they fetch. So it, this is called, um, in other terminology, you will hear it coined as a, a critical resource or a blocking resource. So ideally, to, to optimize the critical rendering path, you want to have as few blocking resources as possible. Now, uh, going back a bit to, uh, to this here, I, I mentioned that we are talking about modern web applications. And you, you might think that, um, or, or automatically, you might have thought of the fact that, OK, that HTML is actually not relevant, because when you have something like Angular or React on the front end, most of the times your HTML is like 10 lines of code, maybe some, some JavaScript and some CSS, and everything then low, and uh, maybe a div with the root of the application that then uh, works on the client, right? But if we want to build something performant, um, we, we cannot simply rely on that, because this means that all the JavaScript will be a blocking resource, because we have to wait for all the JavaScript to be on the front end. We have to wait for the framework to be on the front end, for the framework to load on the front end, and then to start rendering the, the relevant content. 
So the first thing we do with critical rendering is we do server-side rendering. Um, this is uh, something that, um, if you're not familiar with, most of the modern frameworks have the ability uh, to do that. You will spin up a, a simple Node.js server that will take any uh, incoming request um, as, you, as you hit the URL in the browser. Based on the route, uh, it will render the application in a, in a, in basically in a string, and it will uh, put that in, a, in an HTML. It will basically dynamically create the HTML. So the user, as soon as um, he or she gets the, um, gets the application loaded, they, they will get in, in the page source, you will see the fully rendered HTML. This means that we no longer show this uh, ugly spinner to our users, especially on mobile devices. Uh, I've seen applications that take 30 or 40 seconds to load because they have to wait for all the JavaScript to, to be parsed and executed on, uh, on the client. So now that we got a read of, no, now that we have HTML and we have CSS, we no longer need JavaScript to render the page. We, we, are, we don't need JavaScript at the beginning of the, of the loading process. So we defer the JavaScript execution. Uh, we can do that with um, async or defer. Um, it's a very pixelated image. Um, so with async and defer, um, uh, normally, like, like I said, the script, if you put a script in the HTML, it's a blocking resource. The, the HTML parse will stop and will fetch that resource. If you put async, um, the, the fetch will happen in the background, but still the, the, the parse and execution will, uh, will block. If you use defer, you will make sure that uh, HTML is fully rendered. You will make sure pretty much that your first meaningful paint is there, and only after that you start uh, parsing and compiling JavaScript. So defer is something that you, you want to use, especially in the context of modern web applications. All right. Um, so now we, we got rid of we don't have to wait for JavaScript. Um, now we have to focus a bit on what we are rendering. Maybe the HTML and the CSS is still pretty big and still takes a lot of time to, to reach to the user. So this is where we define the, so the fold of the application. Or actually, this is just, just a fancy, fancy word. It's actually the line that separates the, the viewport, what the user actually sees, from what uh, he or she doesn't see. So what we want to make sure is that above the fold, content has priority when, when rendering. Now, this can happen. Um, automatically, because browsers are smart, so Chrome will assign different priorities to resources based on whether they are used uh, in the viewport or not. But you can also, you can also help with that. Um, one technique which is used is uh, to inline the, the critical CSS. So CSS that, that is used for this part here can be extracted. There are libraries that extract that from your whole a uh, style sheet and can be inlined as in a style tag. So this, um, this will, um, this will uh, make, will avoid an unnecessary trip to, to the server. To, so once we fetch the HTML, we will now fetch the CSS. You have to be careful with this. And this is where uh, performance or something maybe that I, I missed at the beginning. Uh, performance is not about uh, these, I mean, they, they are, it's, I cannot give you like, okay, the 10 golden rules, you know, that kind of um, uh, thing, because performance is always about uh, acting and measuring, acting and measuring. You cannot really um, make sure that uh, one single thing of these um, will guarantee, is guaranteed to, uh, to, bring, uh, to, to improve the performance in your application. So this is one good example. If you have if you inline too much CSS, it actually uh, may be the case that your app will actually load slower. So for, ever, for every improvement or for every change, you have to measure it before and after and see whether the trade-off is good enough for you. All right. Um, let's talk about images, because images are a huge part of the application in terms of Percentage usually images are even over 50% of the total size of what the user downloads. Um, first of all, the golden rule of images is that we don't need a full HD image on a 360 pixel screen, and this is probably the, the this is one of the biggest improvement that, that I think everyone can do in, in their in their website. 
the fact that we are shipping huge images, uh, hundreds of, of kilobytes, even megabytes, to, to the users on mobile devices, on 3G networks, or maybe on 2G networks. Uh, if you think of, of developing countries, if you think of countries where actually uh, the internet, uh, like the data is, can be actually expensive, we are still wasting a lot of data with this. So a few ideas to optimize images is, uh, they are like this. First of all, we can load them based on resolution. Um, there are some modern techniques to do that, like um, the, the attribute uh, SRC set, which will allow you to specify different, um, different images for different media queries. So you can actually load them um, yeah, based, on the, based on the screen size. We can also think of the, of the fold again, and we can think of uh, either giving low priority to the images which are below the fold, things like, or, I don't know, things that you load in the footer, or any kind of image content that is not in the viewport, uh, or you can even lazy load that. Um, you can use a modern API, like uh, Intersection Observer, it's a very, it's a very nice, um, it's a nice, very nice technology it's supported now in Chrome and, and Mozilla, I think, um, and it it will basically uh, listen for for your DOM node and it will tell you when that DOM DOM node is in the viewport or when the DOM node is like a hundred pixels from the viewport, so you can uh, trigger some sort of lazy load mechanism on images, and you can use modern formats also. Uh, Google has WebP which uh, decreases the size of images like three or four times of, of, of JPEG. There's also Moz JPEG from, uh, from Mozilla. Of course, it's, it's maybe not easy always to, to implement that. You have to take into consideration all browser support and, and, and to take into consideration all your users. Uh, but still, there, there are techniques to, uh, to handle that, like the new picture uh, tag that you can use to load different formats based on the browser support. Okay. Um, do check out this repo. Uh, it's called Lazy Sizes. And it's very, um, it kind of like has a bit of uh, all of these, uh, especially the, it has the loading images on, on the resolution and the lazy loading part. Um, and it gives you out-of-the-box support for optimizing images. Also, there's this uh, book by uh, Adi Osmani on images. Uh, it's like a really, really comprehensive book on all the images techniques, all the image optimization techniques that you can use on, um, on websites. Um, I will uh, post the slides. Uh, they, they are already public, but I will, I will share the link on, on Twitter later. If you, if you want to check them out. I have some other links in the slides. Okay, once we done, we're done with the images, uh, we can move on and uh, start giving hints to the browser, what's important in, in the page and what not. Link preload is such an example. Uh, with link preload, you can play with the priorities that the browser assigns to, um, to resources. So you can say, okay, um, I know that this font, like web font, will be used in the application. It may not be referred in the head, it might load from CSS for whatever reason, but I'm going to uh, instruct the browser, hey, do preload this as soon as you can because I'm going to use it. Of course, you should not abuse this because you will be uh, killing, the, uh, killing the whole browser operation, but for critical resources, make sure that you preload them so you have them as available as fast as possible. Um, another exciting thing that will be, jo will be coming in the next uh, years, hopefully as soon as possible, is uh, priority hints. Uh, so this will allow you to actually put a, an attribute on, on tags, on scripts, on images. Uh, it will actually work also on, on the fetch, on the new fetch API, so we'll be able to give priorities to, uh, to Ajax requests also. And all of these pretty much um, affect this column here. If you open the network tab in, in, um, in DevTools, uh, the priority, I think the priority column is not enabled by default, so you have to right click on the header and enable it. And you see here exactly how the browser assigns priority to resources. Like I said, you have to measure and act, right? First of all, you have to look here and say, okay, why is 
uh, some resource at low priority, and you just then you maybe you maybe preload the, you, you you will preload it, or you will uh, using the the priority hints you will give it a higher importance. All right, how many people uh, here are using HTTP2 in production today? Okay, I, I always get that, very few hands raised. Why, why? This is like the lowest hanging fruit of performance. Uh, HTTP2 is, is standard, is fully backwards compatible. It's implemented in most of the servers by now. I mean, switching Nginx to HTTP2 or Apache server is like this. Um, and you get a huge performance improvement because with HTTP2, you will have a waterfall chart that looks like this like critical resources that get downloaded in parallel because of the technology behind HTTP2, which was not possible before because of the limitations of, of HTTP1. So um, this is really something that uh, you, can, you can easily do and you can easily add in, in, your, in your application and will automatically give you a, a huge improvement because all the critical resources can be downloaded in parallel now. All right. Finally, we move on to the next chapter. Service workers just got real because they have now full support on, on all the modern browsers, including Edge and Safari. And while people usually think of service workers, they think, of, oh, yeah, I'm going to miss Dino because there will no longer be offline applications. Service workers have also another uh, interesting feature, and that is that uh, they have a very powerful caching mechanism, and you can also use service workers to pre-cache resources. So using this plugin, for example, if you don't want to write your service worker by yourself, you just add the service worker pre-cache webpack plugin to your app, and this will generate the service worker for you, and it will make sure that it uh, pre-caches, it will, uh, it will, yeah, will pre-cache all the, all, the, uh, all the static uh, assets that, that your webpack uh, build generates. All right, so just to sum it up for this part, for, to improve critical rendering, um, I mean, to improve the other critical rendering path, we are using server-side rendering, we are deferring JavaScript execution, optimizing above-the-fold content, we optimize images, we use preload for critical resources, we switch to HTTP2, and we leverage the power of service workers if possible. All right, now time to move to the second phase of the, of the performance uh, enhancements. Now Alice has to think of, OK, we've, we've worked on getting the user to the first meaningful paint as soon as possible. But still, the user, like I said, after that, has to wait for the page to be interactive. And the, the, the more code you, you actually ship to the user, the more time they will take to uh, to wait, the more time it takes for the browser to parse and execute that code and to download it, of course. Um, now, people think that usually it's all about downloading, right? This is what's uh, keeping you from, from being interactive. But downloading the script is not the whole side of the story. As soon as the script is downloaded, it won't run immediately. Like the browser needs to go for a phase called parse and compile all the mod modern uh, JavaScript engines like V8, like Mo Spider Monkey, have this uh, in place. So they have to, to have to parse the code, and they have to compile it into a, into a different language that they are able to run. Um, now, this, this is a very complicated story here. I'm not going to go in depth into the parse and compile, but just keep in mind that this requires some time. And then we have to execute the code, which again, if you're loading uh, Angular with RxJS, with uh, a ton of other uh, resources, with libraries, with Lodash on top of it, you will get to um, a lot of time of waiting for, uh, for all this JavaScript to, to load. And there's this very good article uh, by Adios Mani on JavaScript startup performance. I, if you want to get more into performance, uh, you can basically read everything that, that Adios Money publishes. It's really like, uh, it's like a golden resource for that. But this specific article is very good because it focuses exactly on this part, on how much are the users paying for the fact that you are shipping more and more code to, the, uh, to them. And um, one important thing, which I think was, was also um, 
was also underlined yesterday in, uh, in Vitali's talk was that uh, devices have different times for parsing and compiling JavaScript. Like, there's one thing to, to run JavaScript on a MacBook Pro, and there's a total different thing to run it on an a older phone, on um, Moto G4, which I think is now it's like considered like the standard, uh, uh, the average phone on the market. So yeah, you can look that up in, in this article. So we got to the objective. This is the objective for the second part. We're going to make sure that our bundles are, uh, the bundle size of, of the application is uh, as, as, as small as possible. So first thing, we have to minify and compress it. This is just a, uh, this is like, a, like a reminder. I hope everybody is doing this already. Um, these are actually values that I got from one of the applications I've been working on. And together with my team, we did a lot of these performance improvements on it. Um, so this is the big difference in just using uh, gzip. You get the, the, like the app.js from 679 to 137. Um, and this is, of course, also very easy to, um, to integrate in, in, in all the modern servers and also the browsers understand it. Uh, if you want to go even further, if, you're, if your bundle size is still big here, um, there's Broadly, which is a new algorithm for um, compressing files over the wire. Um, doesn't have support for all the browser. I think IE 11 is missing from that. So you have to, again, to take into consideration your user base. But if, if it's not a problem for you, Broadly will give you even uh, like 20, 30% less code than, than, uh, than JZip, GZip. All right. Um, now this is your friend if we talk about module bundling. This is Webpack Bundle Analyzer. There are multiple tools like this, but I, I like this one because um, I, it, gives you, it gives you a lot of um, flexibility in, in zooming in on your modules and seeing actually what, what they, they are compressed of. So this is where we get into the whole getting into performance mindset, because it's very important to know what, uh, what's in my bundle, right? What, what's, what's inside it? So with Webback Bundle Analyzer, you see it, you, you visually see, OK, I added this library, and the, the, the whole boxes on the, on the left side got bigger because of this. So you get into, into this performance mindset where you are fully aware that you're, what you're building is impacting the, uh, the size of the application. We can use tree shaking. This is the next step. Um, with tree shaking, we um, make sure that code that is not used will not end up in the, in the final bundle. So this is after we uglify, after we minify. Still, if our libraries are not built the right way, so the right way is, of course, on the right side, where um, the two functions are, are exported as, uh, as named exports, whereas here, the functions are, are glued together into a single library object. If we import it this way, then uh, Webpack will automatically know that the multiply function should be removed from the, from the bundle because it's not used. Uh, only thing you have to do is make sure you're not transpiling ES modules to, uh, to require JS. Next, we do code splitting because, OK, we, we, we trimmed down everything we can, but still we are shipping a huge application. So, Code splitting is about taking the, the main bundle and creating uh, smaller chunks out of it. So the main bundle remains um, uh, slimmer. It, it remains with just with the critical parts of the application. And things like uh, account and checkout pages, for example, are, are separately in, in, separate, uh, parts, in separate bundles that are fetched um, on demand. They are lazy loaded. Now, this is very easy to implement with Webpack with the dynamic import syntax. Um, this creates, automatically creates a chunk. Whenever a, Webpack uh, whenever a Webpack finds this, it will create a chunk, and it will uh, then know to lazy load that chunk for you. There's a bit of syntax that you have to learn here, but it's not that much. If you are using React, do check out React Loadable, which gives you, uh, it's like tremendously easy to implement uh, this kind of code splitting operation uh, on your React application. Um, OK, this is how it looks like. This is actually, f again, from our, uh, from our application. Once we did code splitting, we got rid of about, I don't know, 30, 40 kilobytes of JavaScript. We 
push them here in separate chunks that are loaded on demand. So the initial load and the initial parse uh, simply uh, is focused on these two uh, big modules. All right, a few words now on these dependencies because, okay, we got this far, but still there are libraries that we are using which maybe we shouldn't be using. Maybe we have smaller alternatives. Um, we have a lot of, there's a lot of this, um, I know, back and forth saying, okay, do I really need this, right? Do I need Lodash for three functions? Do I need Moment.js just to add two dates because I'm lazy to implement my own function? So be careful with these kind of dependencies. Um, they will bring a lot of code into your bundle. Uh, there are plugins in Webpack that aggressively uh, remove uh, files and removes uh, complexities be be from these libraries, but always, always keep this in mind. Uh, and invest your time in custom components. We did that, and although it's just small victories, one at a time, it's still, it still it outputs uh, relevant. Uh, relevant uh, it, it's a relevant decrease in size at the end, like we did for React Slick, for React Date Picker, or React Tooltip. And you see actually the the amount of kilobytes that we managed to shave off the the, the final bundle. And finally, I, I already mentioned this, but you have to understand your users. You have to know if you need to ship to users that are using IE11, then you need polyfills. If not, maybe you need to selectively, be, uh, selectively in, uh, add your polyfills to the, to the users. Right? If 60%, if 70% uh, of the users are, are on Chrome, they shouldn't download like the promise polyfill or the set polyfill on like, these common polyfills that are get added in applications. Um, one final uh, thing which I like also about uh, like this performance mindset is this, web, uh, this uh, Visual Studio Code plugin called Import Cost. Again, it's, uh, it's not doing anything. It's not changing anything. It's like the Webpack bundle analyzer. It just gets you to the mindset that, okay, I just imported this. Oh, it's adding 8.6 kilobytes to my, to my bundle. Do use lightweight alternatives when possible. Uh, things like if you're starting a project, if it needs to be, if it needs to roll really fast, you can try out Preact or Inferno or something similar if you're using React. Um, uh, and the Angular team, I heard that they are, uh, they are releasing a newer version, a very trimmed down version of Angular for specific needs also. So be always aware of, of these changes. And finally, there's Prepack, which is a very interesting project. There's this nice um, gist by Dan Abramov explaining what Prepack is. And with, just to keep an eye on it, this is not yet production ready, but Prepack will be able to take your code, your minified and uglified code, uh, execute it, optimize it, and make it both uh, smaller and faster. That's the like the... Um, the end result of the whole project. Uh, it's of, of course, it's very complicated, and it will take time to get there, but still keep an eye on, on developments like this if, you're, if performance is critical to your application. Finally, you can use, this, um, you can use the, the measure, uh, the, the coverage uh, plugin in, in Chrome. With this, you can actually see uh, how much code is actually being executed as you go through, through your application. So again, it's a thing of measuring and acting upon it. To sum it up, in order to bring the bundle size to, to, lo to the lowest possible value, we minify and compress it. We use tree shaking, code splitting. We manage our dependencies. We make sure that we're not adding dependencies that are unnecessary. We use lightweight frameworks when possible, and we keep an eye for, uh, for tooling. And of course, like I said, always measure and act on a regular basis. All right, finally we got to the last chapter, which is now that the user uh, has the application, right? the user sees the, the first meaningful paint, we optimized the, um, the time to interactive, so the user can actually interact now with, with the application. But we are still talking about performance as the user actually goes through the application, right? as he scrolls, as, uh, as he or she opens the menu. Um, so there are a lot of these interactions which kind of like build the look and feel of the, like the feel of the application and they are part of UX but they are also uh, they also can be affected by bad performance so what do we do uh, to optimize this to optimize things like animations to optimize things like uh, navigating between screens or just making sure that the flows in the application are smoothly um, 
That's what we want, right? We want to run smoothly. We want to always have that 60 frames per second uh, rendering capability. All right. So how do we do that? Um, first of all, uh, rule of thumb is that we write clean and efficient code, which is obviously, but um, Uncle Bob also approves of that. The, the point I'm trying to make here is that uh, this might not be a, such a big problem as you think, but you have to make sure that you don't do silly things like doing set intervals with very low uh, with a very low uh, timeout period, you don't do uh, nested loops that compute some sort of um, complicated thing without making sure that you're not blocking the whole rendering thing. You're not adding too many uh, watches or too many uh, uh, too many events and stuff like that. For example, Angular One was um, was very well known for having very bad performance once the application grew and grew without the developers uh, knowing how to optimize it properly. So, yeah, clean code is always your your best friend in this. Um, but in order to really understand what's happening, you can use the profiling tool from uh, in in DevTools. Uh, here you will get this kind of diagram and. Like the first time I saw this, I was like, what the hell is this? And then the second time I was like, what the hell is this? But after running it to 10 or 20 times and getting to zoom in on stuff and getting to understand stuff, it starts to make sense. You start to see that it's actually compressed of all the functions that are called in your code. It, it, follows, that it follows those functions. It will tell you how much a function actually took to execute and so on. One important thing which will tell you, it, this will tell you is sorry, uh, is, is this part here, the red parts in the upper part. These are dropped frames. So these are uh, periods when, um, when, the re when, when the website did not work at 60 frames per second. We'll get to that in a, in a bit. So a few things we have to do to avoid, um, to avoid this clunky, um, clunky behavior. First, we have to limit the DOM interaction. So like I said, Frameworks like AngularJS used to be uh, very bad with this because if, if, if not implemented correctly, um, they would simply kill the application at some point. Um, things like React, Angular, Vue, which now have either uh, virtual DOMs or have uh, modern ways of approaching DOM manipulation are better. You can always also use your, your code, but you have to make sure that you're not uh, doing too, too much DOM manipulation in, an, in a synchronous way. You have to know your framework. Um, this is something that, of course, is not easily done. You have to get in-depth. You have to understand the internals of how Angular works or how Vue works. Um, one, one good example of this is in React. We, uh, we finally understood after a while that there's a big difference between a stateless component and a pure component in React. Where you have this new API that you can define a pure component with actually the pure component would yield better results in some cases than, than a stateless component because it will not re-render at each uh, prop change. So that's something to look into, for example. Um, yeah, let's move on because we don't have much time left. Um, this, this is something that you will see in your profile um, a lot of times, a, a forced reflow. Something like this, right? Recalculated style, recalculated style, force reflow, performance bottleneck. So the browser will hint to you that, okay, you are losing frames here because of something that you're doing. In order to understand this, just quickly let's go through this. This is called like the rendering pipeline of the browser. And it starts from JavaScript here, some sort of change, triggering some sort of class change, some sort of um, I don't know, height change, uh, scroll, hover, stuff like that. Uh, this will trigger a style, um, the style phase. The style phase is when uh, all the CSS is recomputed to see on which elements uh, it applies and what changes need to be done. Then we have the layout phase or the reflow phase. In this, in this phase, pretty much the browser takes everything from start and rebuilds the entire uh, it rebuilds the entire DOM visually. So it will have to move all the elements based on the change that you did if they change or not, but still the browser will have to go through all the elements to check that. Finally, we move to the paint phase where each pixel is actually uh, colored based on color, background color, shadow, border, stuff like that. 
And finally, we have the composite phase, which is the last one, which will tell you which elements are on top, right? Because when you have the full DOM, you might have overlapping elements. So the composite phase will tell you uh, which element ends up on top um, when, when the render will actually happen. And everything, the whole rendering pipeline, needs to happen uh, in one frame. So it, it, needs to, it needs to happen in, uh, or actually, sorry, it needs to happen for each frame, right? So um, it, you don't have a lot of budget to do that. So one thing which is interesting is if, if you go follow this link, there's a very nice gist by Paul Irish, um, where he explains that um, not only uh, changing stuff, not only modifying um, things in, in JavaScript can lead to a reflow, but also uh, asking for things. So the browsers are smart, and they tend to pre-optimize things. Um, like, they tend to optimize the whole rendering mechanism. So, for example, when you're asking for the scroll position for, for an element, you're actually forcing the browser to stop, to compute everything, to do the rendering pipeline, and tell you the scroll position, because it might, uh, the browser might not have it at this point. It might be, uh, it might be um, just an estimate of where it, it could be. So it's very interesting that if you, if you do things, if you, if you call, if you, in your code, if you're calling for things, if you're getting things, you're still forcing uh, reflows in, in your application. And you get that a lot with, with React um, if, you're not, if you're not careful with it. Uh, talking very quickly about animations, you have to make sure that you can avoid certain steps here, like avoiding the layout phase at all. This means that you shouldn't change things like the height or the width of the elements uh, during animations. You can also avoid the paint. So this is like the most performant type of animation that you can get. And you can get this with things like with just using opacity and transform. Uh, these, only, these are the only two properties that are only using the composite, uh, uh, the, the composite phase to, to do the animation. We actually had a very nice experiment in our application where a colleague transformed uh, the menu animations from heights and um, yeah, from, from animating on height to animating on opacity and, uh, and uh, transforms. And it's just working beautifully now. It's, it's, a, it's a clear difference of, of performance as you, as you scroll through the application and the menu toggles on and off. Uh, do check out this link also. It's, it's a great resource for everything related to rendering performance, to optimizing these uh, runtime, um, runtime operations, and optimizing the rendering pipeline here. Right. One other thing which you can do, which is very, it's again a very, it's a low hanging fruit for performance, is using passive event listeners. Uh, this is the example. Um, the right side, they are using passive event listeners. The left side, they aren't using. So you can clearly see the difference in how smooth the scrolling operation is. Um, with, um, with passive event listeners, the only trade-off is that you cannot call prevent default on that event. Uh, it's sort of like a weak reference somehow uh, if, if you want to, to um, connect it with something. The only thing you have to do is just say here for, for scrolls or for touch events just to, to add, it, add the passive true. This is also something that we did and it, it automatically created a, f uh, a smoother um, experience for the users as they scroll through the application. All right. Just to summarize, um, write clean code, limit DOM interaction, know your framework, make sure you understand the rendering pipeline if you need to get in depth into that, and use passive event listeners when, when possible. Now, I'm going to uh, quickly go over some tools because we're close to the end of the session. Oh yeah, I forgot the last part, profile your page. You use the, the, the Google profiler, it's very, very powerful. So uh, a couple of tools that you can use, a couple of tools that you should bring into your like, regular development um, workflows. First is Lighthouse. Lighthouse is um, it's a very, it's a very nice tool from, uh, from Google, 
it's it used to be standalone project now it's part of the of the of the dev tools you can audit uh, your website on lighthouse and it will give you things like uh, the a score for progressive web apps for performance accessibility i think now it has also an seo se section um, and you simply by using lighthouse you learn a ton of things about performance because lighthouse was built by um, by these awesome people that understand all this performance optimization. So they will, the, the, the tool itself will tell you, uh, oh, okay, you have to do this, you can do that, make sure you optimize images, make sure you're removing unnecessary CSS and stuff like that. Um, then we have to uh, talk about the Chrome DevTools. Um, I, I, I'm honestly, I'm, I haven't tried uh, a lot of the dev tools and other browsers. I'm pretty sure that they have similar features. But the Chrome team is really working a lot on performance. And these three tabs are your friends here. Uh, if you notice, I have them as my first three tabs in, in Chrome always. Network performance and audits. Audit is actually the lighthouse thing, just in, in dev tools. Uh, performance is the, um, the profiling thing that we, we've seen earlier. And a network, of course, uh, you can see a lot of, um, you can see, get a lot of data on using the waterfall chart and so on. If you want to get more in depth with how the app loads and the network side, uh, this tool is very good, GT Metrics. Not necessarily because of scores and stuff like that, but it will give you a very good, uh, a very good image of how your resources are fetched. There's also a web, web page test which is a similar tool. I like this one because um, it allows you to, um, it, it gives you a bit, I mean, it, the data seems a bit clearer to me. I don't know. It, also, web page test is very good for that. Um, if you want to actually introduce this into your pipeline, you can use something like Caliber app or Speed Curve. Uh, this is not a free application, but it, it's something that if your if if your website is actually critical, it will it, it makes it, it makes sense to pay for it uh, to bring it into your pipeline. So this will do um, this will do automated checks daily or for every build and stuff like that. So it will give you notifications that something is wrong in, and the performance just went off or something. Uh, towards the end, let's keep in mind that this is a marathon we're doing here. So it's. Although there are some things that you can, of course, implement the next day, maybe there are some things that I just presented that you saw that you can maybe just take advantage of them. Uh, these are small wins, but you have to always maintain this. You have to make sure that you, you give this time, right? Performance should be part of your regular development, um, development workflow. Um, for example, we did this. We did a, a checklist, or our, our personal checklist for for front-end performance with, with our team. We just by analyzing a few projects we're working on, and we we now we're slowly introducing this checklist as a, a sort of as a, as a QA uh, thing. As soon as we um, we end up with with a sprint or we we ship something. Uh, finally. Um, you do have to take time, right, for this. And everybody keeps telling me this, that we have no time to do that because we are pressed to, um, to handle this. But I think this is a problem of trade-offs. But the problem is here is that we're not trading time and uh, the performance improvements. We are actually trading time and quality. And this is something that doesn't necessarily uh, work out for me. I, I prefer that we take more time to to work on the on the products than to uh, than to ship bad quality, and the way I see it, we used to have this right. We used to say we write code, and that's pretty much it. We um, we ship it and it works. But now today, I, I I guess that most of us understand that writing tests is also part of the development cycle, right? You cannot. Uh, like 10 years ago, maybe you could, someone would say, oh, you don't need to write tests. You just ship the code and it will work. We'll, we'll do some QA afterwards. Now we understood that tests are part of the development lifecycle. But now I think we should be moving into understanding that things like security, UX, or performance are also part of the, of the development lifecycle. And we should be doing them uh, as we develop and not at the end when uh, we say, oh, shit, we have a performance issue in, in production or we have a security problem. So this is what I call the ladder of software quality. And with this, I'd like to thank you for joining this session. I hope it was 
Uh, it was interesting for you. I hope you got a lot of a uh, lot of information out of it. And yeah, do I'm right here after the talk if you want to talk more about it. Thank you.